You can raise that screen. Timmy, you can raise that screen. Well, good morning, everybody. This is our, our Thanksgiving service, I guess you could say, because you're going to have a lot of thanks and good songs this morning. So we're going to start off with one. Here, please turn to 435, and let's all stand and sing, We Gather Together. That's what we're doing, gathering together. We'll start with our announcements this morning because we've got a few more than normal. <clears throat> the their office, the room right here past the uh, kitchen, is now being used for a nursing room. Only moms and the nursing babies can be in there. Please, no siblings, other children, or family members. Also, please knock before entering. So I'm assuming that is the door open. Okay. Now, for the nursery, the operating hours for the nursery are now are 10, 15 to 12 p.m. The age of the children in the nursery is 0 to 4. The only people allowed in the nursery are those who have been background checked and screened by the church, those scheduled to work in the nursery that day. And thirdly, we have there will be children's choir practice right after the service today for about 15 minutes. Please have the parents pick up their kids at that time. Is that about right, Paul? So the closer we get to Christmas, the more they're going to practice. All right, women's Bible study is tonight at 6 o'clock. This week's Wednesday service is, being, is canceled due to Thanksgiving. <clears throat> outdoor Christmas, remember, remember to mark your calendars, Outdoor Christmas Fellowship is December 16th. I believe that starts at to be determined, probably about 5, I'm guessing. Now, we do, you do notice there is a new piano. Um, it's been donated to the church by private donation. But uh, we have, um, not part of it, not all of it. But we do have a sound system that uh, Cameron and Rob are trying to put together. We're going to be changing speakers and all kinds of things like that, we hope, in the future. But... So what we're asking, if you would like to donate to something to the sound system, you know, just put a memo on your check, and we'll uh, it'll go for the for the new piano and and the sound system. So I believe that's all our announcements this morning. So we can't we can't sit on this, but you'll know whenever we start singing it. How many of y'all have sang this next song? It's in your insert. It's "I Will Enter His Gates." Please stand. We sing it. You know, a few years here. But if you're new, I know you haven't sang it, I bet you. I'm just guessing. We're going to sing it twice. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. 
I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice because he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. Excited for Thanksgiving, Brother Renee? Would you please come up, please? Good morning. Oh, you you may sit, please. How are you guys doing? Wow. You look really good from here. <laughs> um, so for those of you that know, don't know, this little section is for us to thank God for everything that he has done for us. Uh, and again, you know, every time I come here, I feel like I, I say the same, but that, thing's, that thing never gets old. God gave his son for me, for you, for the ones that believe. Not for all the world. Unfortunately, like a lot of people think, you know, everybody's going to go to heaven. No. He gave his life for the ones that believe in him. I believe in him. And it's amazing. I don't need anything else. Nothing else. If I were to throw in prison and rotten there, but I have salvation from God, that's sufficient for me. Unfortunately, you know, we go out in the world, we see, you know, our eyes doesn't help a lot. You know, we see a better car, we see a better house, we see, you know, we see better clothes. We see, we always see, we're always wanted more and more and more. Why? Because we're wicked, right? Sanctification has not made us the way that we're supposed to be, even here in earth. So I want to share uh, Psalm 5, Psalm Five. And I'm sorry, my English is horrible. When I get nervous, it gets, gets worse. I, uh, I was going to grab one of the, a young guy, but he didn't make it on time, I guess. So I'm going to have to read it myself. So apologies for the words that are about to come out of my mouth. But Psalm number five says, Give, and then I forgot my glasses. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sounds of my cry. My King, my God. For to you do I pray, O Lord, in the morning your heart, you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not God who delights in wickedness. Evil men may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord adores the bloodthirst and deceitful men. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. For nothing that I did, for his mercy. Because he looked down and he saw me. Don't know why, but he grant me. His favor, and he grant me, and he allowed me to repent from my sins, give myself, surrender myself to my Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the only reason, like we sing, I will enter his gate with thanksgiving in my heart. That's the only reason. 
So, dear friend, if you're here and you have not experienced this, please, please look for help. Seek for help. You know, some of us, you know, communicate to each other. One is doing not so good during the week. So we text each other, hey, Atticus, you know, I'm not feeling well. Please pray for me in this specific situation that I'm struggling. You need to look for help in the body of Christ. You need to be here every Sunday, not because, you know, the religions call for it, but because the, the Lord Almighty is, has something for us in here, in this place. Not in my house through a TV, but in here. So bow down your head with me and let's thank God for everything that he has done. Lord, thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the opportunity that you grant us to be here. The opportunity that you give us to listen to your word. Thank you because a lot of people around us is being sick. So many of them are not here because of that. Because of that, but even in that, Lord, we know that your mighty, powerful hand is working in their lives. Thank you because for some reason, you allow me to be healthy today and I'm here. Thank you because you allow my brother Atticus to bring your word this morning, Lord. Thank you because you are God and thank you because... Nothing that goes around me is outside your will. Thank you because you allow me to have a job to provide for my family, to help my friends when they need. Thank you because you allow me to pray for my brothers and sisters in the congregation, Lord. And thank you because you give us a place that we can be inside, comfortable, with a nice temperature. And all of this... It's because you're good. None of this we deserve, Lord. How many people around the world don't have not even a tenth of what we have? But you allow us to have that, and we want to thank you for everything you do for us and everything you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please turn to 408 and let's sing My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Oh, mm-hmm. 
Please turn to 433. Let's sing, Now Thank We All Our God. stand. Good morning. Good morning. Please turn to 1 Timothy 6. We're going to be reading from verse 1 to verse 10. And it says, let all who are under a yoke of bondservants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who are of believing masters must not be disrespectful on the grounds that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Teach and urge these things if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound word of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produces envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicion, and a constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and depra deprived of the truth, 
imagining that the godliness is a means of gain, but godliness with contentment is greater gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunges people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. For this is the word of God. Thank you. Please remain standing as we turn to 365 and sing ancient words. 365. for such a great morning, Lord, to sing songs to you. Lord, we just ask for your mighty blessing each time we walk into your house. Lord, we do lift up Pastor Jason this morning as he is uh, not feeling well. Lord, we do pray for Veronica and the kids, and Lord, that you protect uh, each one of them as we go through this next week and just bring him back to us as healthy as ever. And pray for patience with Veronica is taking care of him and the kids also. Lord, for those that are not here this morning that are ill, we also lift them up to you, Lord, that you'll put your protective hand upon them and bring them back healthy and and ready to uh, serve your serve you in this house next week. Lord, we just pray for Brother Atticus this morning as he found out about halfway through the week that he'd be preaching this morning. Lord, we look forward to his words that uh, he's going to bring to us, Lord, about hospitality. 
And Lord, the things that we should look forward to and, and do this next week, especially during the week of Thanksgiving. Lord, be with him. Have, let him be bold to us. Lord, I'll open our hearts to, to his word. And Lord, we just thank him for stepping in this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat>
you know, relationships like that? Do we show hospitality to one another? Some people stop even here, and they're unfaithful husbands. They're absent fathers. They've abandoned their children. So hospitality does start with the immediate family. Are we providing and creating a warm and gracious home for even our, our wives, our husbands, our children? And I want you all to think, as I kind of go through the sphere of recipients of hospitality, think of where you find yourself exercising this virtue. So we have immediate family, those who are within your own household. What about friends? I think we all continue on here. We like to have people over whom we like. Uh, what about acquaintances? Okay, now people we've met a couple times. We don't really talk to them. We'll invite them probably. They make it to the Christmas dinner at some point perhaps. But what about people you dislike? Who's all there? Are we still, is the whole church still in agreement? Have you got here the guy who tells the boring stories, the, the lady who is super picky and complains even when you try your best? I mean, do we invite them all? And then what about, I have last, is strangers all together, people we don't even know. Are we opening up our homes to them? Maybe we'll take them out to lunch. That's safe. Ooh, we just met them. I like Chick-fil-A. Well, that's safe. <laughs> we can go home and part ways. They'll never know where I live. They may know what I drive. But, I mean, they're a stranger. So it's kind of, we know what that means. It makes us nervous. Part of that is sort of fear why we wouldn't invite them, we don't know what they're going to do. We don't know if they're safe. We don't know if they're not safe. We don't know if, um, we just don't know anything about them. But the idea, the regular de definition of hospitality ends with, you know, guests, visitors, or providing a gracious reception to strangers as well. And the biblical definition actually emphasizes showing hospitality to strangers, people that we don't even know. And it can be a scary thing. So before we look at and get the biblical definition of hospitality, and we'll build off of that, I have just a big list of examples in Scripture of people who showed hospitality. I counted them up. I got 17 examples, and we're going to just blaze through them real quick. It took me like a minute, two minutes to come up with all these because it's so re the Scripture is so re replete with all these examples. So I thought of Abraham first and foremost. He received, it was the Lord and a couple of angels and he was generous to show hospitality, welcomed them into the tent, offered them something to eat. I think that's probably one of the first obvious examples of hospitality. You have Lot showing hospitality to the same two angels. He did not know they were angels. I, at least I don't think he does. He welcomes them into the home, tries to protect them from the men of Sodom. You, uh, you all should probably know that story pretty well. Then you have Joseph offered hospitality to his brothers, albeit with ulterior motives. We recognize that. Big spread. They even said, wow, you know, look at all this food. Benjamin got the bigger portion. That was, host that was very hospitable. They recognized that, and they were in awe. What about Gideon? He offered food to the angel of the Lord. That's another example. And Jesse, father of David, uh, received Samuel very hospitably and served him. Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. I mean, that is, that's probably the most epic of all hospitality examples I think we have in all of Scripture. The wealthiest man in all the world receives this great retinue with Queen Sheba, and she was just in awe. She said she had no spirit or breath left in her after seeing everything, and uh, they both exchanged innumerable gifts to one another. Very hospitable. Esther and King Artaxerxes, it's kind of a funny one to me. This works with the cynical definition. I mean, Esther throws a party for her husband, the king. It's all his stuff. And he's like, wow, this is super nice. What do you want, Esther? And she had ulterior motives also. What did she say? Come to another party. I mean, it's kind of funny. You ever wonder that? I mean, that's so funny. Why, why not just ask him then? I think she kind of chickened out for the first one. I was like, we'll have to do it again. Um, yeah, so that's, and that kind of, all of those, all of those we recognize pretty much off the bat. It's kind of the modern thought of what we think of hospitality, welcoming people over, feeding them, providing for them. Um, we're going to send them on their way. It's not, not, not too, too much commitment there. I think of Jael and Sisera, if you all know the story. She was real hospitable, wasn't she? Another, another one with ulterior motives. She's even praised for it in the song. He asked for water and she gave him milk and, and a nail. So hospitality, we get that. That's kind of the modern thought of hospitality. But the scripture, I'm going to read some, some more biblical examples and see and kind of segue into the biblical definition 
of hospitality, and we'll see that it's a lot more than, than just having a fancy dinner party. Okay, so what about David and Mephibosheth? Favorite name in the Bible. David and Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan who was slain in battle, and David and Jonathan had a great love for one another. And David, after he's established as king, says, is there anyone less of the household of Jonathan to whom I can show mercy to, or whom I can, whom I can exalt and whom I can help? And Mephibosheth was lame in both of his feet, kind of a useless fellow, especially in that day and time, not going to be much good to anyone. He can't work. And David brings him into the, into the palace and, and says, from now on, you're going to eat at my table every day for the rest of your life. And now that, we recognize that as hospitality, but almost to another level, right? It's, it's all there, all the elements are there, but it's gone, he's gone even further that every day Mephibosheth is going to be an integral part of David's life and fellowship. And then we have the widow of Zarephath. If you all know who she was in the book of Kings, 1 Kings, she's the one who received Elijah. Elijah shows up right when she's about to bake her last bit of bread, and she says, I'm going to make it for my son and I. We're going to eat it, then we're going to die. And Elijah really inserted himself and said, well, make some for me too and let me eat. And miraculously, the Lord provided continually for the widow of Zarephath to where the oil and the flour the, never ran out, and they ate bread for quite some time there, but she graciously received Elijah, and not just for one dinner, not for Thanksgiving or Christmas, but he was there for quite some time. What about another example from the uh, book of 2 Kings, the Shunammite woman? She's not named. She was married. She didn't have any children, but she kept noticing Elisha and his servant passing by, and so she always invited them in. They fed them. And then after a while, she says, to her husband, I see that this is a man of God, therefore let us build onto the house a little room for him that he can stay in. I mean, this is, this is hospitality to a whole other level. We're going to alter the house, make an investment into the prophet and not necessarily for ourselves. And Elisha received that very graciously and asked what should be done for her, this, that she's done this wonderful thing to us. And she didn't want anything, but they, uh, they blessed her and the Lord blessed her with a son. The Shunammite woman, the widow of Zarephath, unnamed women recorded for all of eternity in this book. What about, and then we're going to kind of get outside of um, the modern thought of hospitality. We're going to move to closer to what the Bible has in mind. What about Ruth? Ruth, the widow, the daughter-in-law of Naomi. Uh, was she hospitable? It kind of stands out is that she didn't have a home. She's a widow. She was poor from the land of Canaan. Would you consider that hospitality, that she stayed with her widowed mother-in-law, older lady, useless somewhat in, in any society during that time? And then here's Ruth, young, probably still vibrant and beautiful, decides to commit herself not to go find another husband and perhaps start a life and her family, but she commits to her mother-in-law and clings to her and returns to the land of Um, Israel with her, and then perpetually serves her. Ruth goes out and does the gleaning so that they can eat. Is that biblical hospitality? Is that modern hospitality? Choosing a totally different path of life and sacrificing for who knows how long. I mean, how long is it going to be like this? Then you have, uh, here's another one I, I really like this, Obadiah, back to Kings during the time of Elijah, Obadiah did what? He was a faithful man of God during the reign of Ahab and Jezebel, when Jezebel and Ahab were slaughtering all the priests of the Lord and all the prophets. Obadiah, still a servant to Ahab, covertly hid 50 prophets in two different caves. So 50 to a cave, he he hid 100 prophets to the risk of his own life. He didn't have a home, didn't put him in a home, didn't have a nice spread for them, wasn't fancy glasses, clean bathrooms, but he hid 50 to a cave. I don't know where the caves are. Are they his caves? Is it his property? I don't know. But Obadiah risked his very life for this, for these people. Is that modern hospitality? Are we going to hide people on our land? What about Mordecai? Mordecai brought his daughter-in-law, Esther, who threw the big party, He brought her into the home and raised her up as his own daughter after her parents died. We don't know how they died. 
we know that Mordecai took her in and committed himself to her for life to raise her up. Is that what we think of when we think of hospitality, brethren? We have many New Testament examples, and we'll probably get into more of those as we move on, but just to mention some off the top of our head, I think of Zacchaeus, invited the Lord into his home, invited the disciples. What about uh, the Philippian jailer? I mean, here's a guy, he was ready to fall on his own sword after thinking criminals had escaped when the earthquake shook the prisons, and Paul stops him, and they say, don't, don't harm yourself, we're still here. And what does he do? He takes, as far as he knows, convicted criminals in a prison and brings them home and cleanses their wounds, feeds them, and provides for them. I mean, as far as he knew, these guys could have been murderers. Who knows what they are? But he saw, that he saw their need, and he was struck by their faith and by the message of the gospel. And this is where we kind of get the idea of hospital from, from hospitality, is that it's supposed to be a place where people can come to be healed. And the Philippian jailer fulfilled that immediately. I mean, I don't even know if he's converted yet. And he brings them home, heals them of their wounds, and feeds them. He's a great example. What about Philemon? It's said of him that he refreshed the saints. You have Lydia also in the region of Philippi. Lydia, as soon as she hears the gospel message, the Lord opens her heart to receive what has been said to her. And she welcomes Paul and his companions in the home. And the reason why I picked hospitality was in reading and memorizing 3 John, Gaius stood out to me a lot as a very hospitable person. It said of Gaius that he welcomed the brethren, though they were strangers to him. And it just struck me that we have this guy's name written for all of eternity. In the book of the record, we're gonna, you're going to know this is Gaius in the new earth. When you see him, well, I think we'll know. The deeds follow us, brethren, and I long to meet Gaius. So we'll give you the biblical definition now. And we'll open up our Bibles. If we go to Romans 12, let's grab a biblical definition now that we've seen some of these examples. And it's not to say that the other examples, Abraham, Lot, Joseph, even Esther and the king, it's not to say that that's not hospitality. We understand that it is. We want to go farther, though, than just a common understanding of it and see if there's something richer for us. So maybe to get the whole context, our target verse is 12.13, but maybe we'll start in uh, verse 1 of Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we... Though many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. And here we are. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. So we're going to draw our definition off of Romans 12, 13. But the appeal here in Romans 12, in light of all that Paul has said in the previous 11 chapters, he's really exhorting them not to think highly of themselves and to serve one another. It's a whole call to the service of the body of Christ and to recognize your membership in that body, brethren. So it's not Reformed preaching, right, unless we mention a Greek word or two. So as much as I can, as much as I tried, we're going to look at the two words, and I 
looked them up in the Greek and had some help from other pastors. We have contribute and hospitality. So contributing is, in the Greek, it's koinonio, which is very close to koinonia, where we get fellowship, the word for fellowship, which is used all throughout Scripture. Koinonio is in the Strong's Concordance, just one, one off from it. It means to share, communicate, share in, have a share of, have fellowship with. So it can be used as distribute and contribute. Um, Paul, it was, the, it was translated here, but you could read it, have fellowship in the needs of the saints. Have fellowship in the suffering of the saints. That's one way that you could look at that. To have fellowship with someone else's need is more than just, I'm going to give you the $20 you need to pay the meal or whatever it is. It is to be made a partaker in the need of someone else. And then we have the word hospitality is philoxenia, which is interesting. So philo is kind of derivative of uh, one of the three Greek words for love, which is brotherly affection. And xenia was, I believe it was, stranger. Uh, hospitality to strangers is the, is the root word there. So it's love. It translates pretty literally love to strangers or love to show hospitality to strangers. So have fellowship in the needs and love to show hospitality to, to actual strangers. So to be a partaker with someone, enjoy suffering and needs is, is what the biblical definition is. Not just to meet the needs financially or even to meet maybe a counseling need, but to enter in to the very suffering and need of the person as if you were one with them, brethren. If we are all of one body, if one of us is sick, absent, if one of us is falling into error, into sin, that should pierce our hearts. And we should not only seek to resolve the situation, but to empathize and to join them in this. Galatians. Galatians 6, it's bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And what do we, I mean, that's so graphic. It's such an easy picture to bear one another's burden. You don't just see someone struggling under something and just walk by and be like, man, you can do it. Now you get under there and you get your arms under there and you pull that up and hold it with them and you bear their burden. So that's, that's kind of our, our, our biblical definition. I kind of have a formula for it. It almost seems that hospitality is more than just inviting someone over, having dinner, and it's, uh, I have a little formula that fellowship plus giving equals hospitality. It's meeting the need as we fellowship, brothers and sisters. When we, we're going to come together with a lot of family and friends, some of them believers and some of them non-believers. And when you look around the table, and you maybe hear a brother or sister talking about some, some hardship maybe, they're having trouble with disciplining their children, they're having, you know, concerns or doubts about this or that, or maybe even you find out that uh, they're Catalytic converter got stolen, popular here in Houston. Man, think about what, what you can do to help that person and not just tell them, be warm and be filled and send them off. It's a real opportunity coming up to show the love of Christ. So serving plus giving combined to make up hospitality. This is an empowerment of the Holy Spirit. I kept thinking that hospitality is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and I had this verse in mind, but then, you know, reading the whole context, it seems he stops with the gifts, and then by verse 9, he starts to show the working out of that. But this is a spirit-empowered, I will say, virtue. It requires, it requires giving, and that we see is a listed spiritual gift. Those who contribute in generosity. Brethren, you see someone like Obadiah and Mordecai, you see how all the fruit of the Spirit is going to have to come together to perform such a thing. What is the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians? It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, and self-control. Brethren, if you're going to do what Mordecai does and take on someone else's child to raise them, you're going to need patience. You're going to need love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness. You're going to need to be self-controlled. It will require all the workings of the Holy Spirit. It is a divine power that is necessary to accomplish this very command. And it is a command, brethren. Verse 13, 
he's laying out how we are to live as Christians. As I read from Galatians, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is a high and lofty law. So thinking through all those examples, we see how many of our biblical examples met that biblical definition. And now, I don't want us to forget that this is primarily to strangers. In Hebrews, it says, do not, in Hebrews 13, 1, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Some translations do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. The word in the Greek for hospitality to strangers is one word. It's just one word there. And it's the same word that we have in Romans here. The emphasis is on the stranger. So I have three points for a sermon. A sermon has to have minimum three points, right, in these reform circles. So I have number one, first point, is going to be practical, how to show hospitality. Number two is why should I show hospitality. Number three are hindrances to showing hospitality. I'm not going to spend much time on the first point. This is one of those things that is a natural law on the heart of man. I am going to give you some practical points, and I'm going to give you some scriptures, but brethren, we should know how to show hospitality as it's written on the heart. We think of the golden rule is do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. A lot of the times, I find that this verse is used in a negative context in that after the kid kicks his sister, we say, would you want that done to you? No, then don't do that to her. But I think the point is far richer when we think about it in a positive context, when you take the initiative yourself and to do unto someone who is in need before they even have requested or they may never request, we should know that when someone has been in a car accident and their car is totaled and they don't have money for another car or a rental car, brethren, you should know they need a car. I'm not saying buy them a car. Give them a car, let them borrow a car, would you not? Have you ever, I mean, we've been there where all of a sudden the pipes break, we were in a freeze, water's pouring out, don't know what to do, don't know how to fix it, material was not around. Brethren, we've been in a situation where we needed someone to come and help us. We're not that independent, as, as highly as we might think of ourselves, to have not ever been in such a need. It is a natural law of the heart that we know when we're in trouble, emotionally, spiritually, financially, we may not ask for help because we're proud and we're stubborn, but we know in our heart we wish someone would come and help us. So, first point, how to show hospitality. Subpoint A, whatever, is greet the brothers by name. Uh, there's, a, there's a particular verse for this. And uh, you don't have to go there. I'm just going to read these verses off. I'm going to give you all these verses so you can put them down in your notes. But um, I'm going to go through them real quick. Don't bother flipping there. So 3 John, verse 15, the ending, he closes, Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. It's the command of God. Greet the friends by name. You have in Corinthians, greet one another with a holy kiss. I mean, that, that implies we're going to like one another, I think, if we're going to be doing a holy kiss. You're going to be close. But it, it begs that we're going to know one another. To greet someone by name, you have to know them. It's going to take you staying after church, perhaps, five minutes minimum, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Meet, meet these people. Meet the beloved that we're going to be in all of eternity with, that we fellowship with together. We ought to know one another's names. It's the first step of intimacy, is it not? And be patient. I'm bad with names. People are bad with names. If you're meeting somebody again and you know, just tell them your name. Give them, a, you know, give them some help. But we're commanded by God to greet one another by name. Step one. Number two, bring them into your home. We've already kind of said that. Isaiah 58, 6 through 7. Is not this the fast that I choose to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house. I mean, he wants you to bring the homeless into your house. And you think, well, Isaiah, that was different than the homeless now. It's a whole different world out there. They might be dangerous. I have children. I have a wife. I have 
I have stuff. I have nice things. We just got the new carpet. What if they bring a dog? I mean, people bring all sorts of, they break all the boundaries when you invite the stranger. Who knows what they're going to do? He says, bring the homeless poor into the home, into your house. Not just go to a restaurant, brother. Obviously, another point, feed them. That's going to happen probably if they come to your house. I don't have a verse for that. We'll use the last one. There's plenty in there. Subpoint D, see to their need and be aware. And this is probably where it really starts to get serious. Like I said before, when you have them over and you're going to be visiting, I mean, one of the major points of why we get together, brethren, is we would know we probably wouldn't associate with one another. We don't all like the same things. We don't like the same music. We're not, we don't have the same interests. We're not all into creation and the planets and the stars. We're not all into music. But the body of Christ is so fitted and the Lord has so orchestrated it that people who would possibly not associate with one another can now build up and strengthen one another. And when we talk and, com- and conversate, we need to be so attentive to care and to see the need of one another and to think, how can I meet that need? When we pray and you realize this brother is not going to make rent, their car is totaled, how are they going to pay for their baby, whatever it may be, brethren, pray that the Lord would use you to do the very work. Be like, what did Isaiah say? The Lord asks. He's asking, who shall I send? And Isaiah, here I am. Send me. Send me, Lord. So First John, see their need and be aware. John is terrifying, guys. I don't know if Y'all like John in 1 John. Um, he makes me the most uncomfortable. If, I, if I'm conversing with someone and I sense that they're probably not a true convert and they're very comfortable and proud, I recommend them to read 1 John. And tell them to love it. So 1 John 3.17, But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? That is so rough. You have the world's goods and you see your brother in need. Brethren, that is, that's pretty plain. See their need and help them. You know, James, you say to your brother, go, be warm and be filled and you give not what is necessary to the body. How does that help them? Does that faith save? Okay. Point E, uh, next, moving on. We should feel with them. So we stopped at Romans 13 and 12, 13, but we have in 15, he kind of concludes and says, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. We are to partake in the feelings of one another. I mean, he crescendos into all of these great things that we are to be doing and exercising, and, and it's, and it's to, to enter into very the very heart of one another, and to feel with one another, to rejoice when they're rejoicing, and that's great, and then to weep with those who weep. We are to feel with them. We also have 1 Peter 3.8. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. I mean, with the humility of mind, not thinking only of yourself, you will enter in to a sympathy and a love for one another. And not just, not just again, financial, but with, but with their very struggles with sin, their very struggles and doubts. Brethren, it hurts when you go and you try to contend with someone for the faith. I talked to Brother Lewis. I don't see him here today, but he's got a really close friend that he's been trying to share the gospel with. And... He's saying it hurts just getting rejected over and over again with some aberrant theology, strange doctrine, knowing when someone visits the church and people recommend, them, recommend me to talk to them and they give me a heads up, hey, by the way, this is an unbeliever or this is, um, this is someone committed to Catholic doctrine. I get so dreadful of that encounter because I know the difficulties and the hardship to be rejected. 
And so, last point, brethren, under how to show hospitality is to meet their supply. And that will just hit Romans 12, 13 again. Contribute to the necessities of the saints. Contribute's a good word. I said it's, it means fellowship, it can. It does mean just to distribute resources. What, what can I do to meet this need, brethren? It doesn't have to be the full thing. It could be something small. It could be a meal. It could be a little bit of money to help supplement a cost. Meet their supply. Meet what, meet what they need, brethren. We are stewards, and we are on loan for all of this stuff. We have so much given to us, and not to be a guilt trip, but, but, but brethren, we're doing pretty well in the Western church. I would like to think that we could get our minds out to the church abroad. Okay, so that's the close of point number one. We're going to move into point number two. Just a quick question to reflect on. When we go through all these how-tos, maybe perhaps in your mind you're working through, okay, I can do this thing. I'll start greeting people. I'll start meeting this and that. Did you have the stranger in mind? Or were you still thinking, oh, how can I help you know, the guy I like, the one that I sit next to, the one that I get lunch with? Did y'all go right back to that? Because even as I was writing this all out, I'm like, okay, I can, I can connect more with with, with Mikey, I can connect more with Keith, or I can want to spend time with Gigi. And I kind of, I forgot the stranger for a moment. Have we forgotten him already? Point number two. Why should I do this thing? Okay. I mean, you just told me to give of my own supply, my time, my resources, perhaps even put myself at risk, bring the homeless poor into the house where my children are, why should I do this thing? What right do you have to tell me such a thing? Number one, they're not in any particular order except the first two I put as preeminent. The first is because it's so obvious. It is commanded of God and is demanded of us. It is commanded. Not only the verse that we just had in Romans 12, 13, uh, what about Galatians 5.13? For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And if you read on in Galatians from that point, he's going to list, that's where we get the list of the fruit of the Spirit and how the, the flesh is going to wage war with the Spirit. As if he's trying to imply, brethren, our flesh is going to want to serve itself in this regard, and we are not going to want to do this. This is going to be very difficult. I picked this topic. I had Thursday morning. I realized I'm going to have to preach. And I thought, well, what am I going to preach on? I don't have much time. I'm still working. What do I do? And I thought, oh, hospitality. That's fun. That'll be easy. I like it. We've opened up our home to a Bible study, and, and we've had people over. say, oh, I'll get it. It'll be fun. It'll be nice, and it'll be easy. Brethren, this study terrifies me. It is far more than what I ever thought it was. So it's commanded of us, brethren. I think we see that plain enough. Second point, this is the heart of the whole sermon, if I were to have one. I subconsciously, I guess, put it somewhere in the middle. But why should I show hospitality to the stranger? This is the chief. It is like Christ. We ought to be doing this, brethren, because it is like our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to do this very thing. How so? The Son of Man had not where to lay his head. What home did he invite anybody over? He's the one getting invited everywhere. He was invited to Simon's house. Simon was a bad host. We have that recorded for all of eternity. He did not wipe his hair. He did not weep over him. Simon tried, I guess. But how is it that Jesus Christ showed hospitality? What is it he has done? Where would we go to see this, brethren? Would you all turn to Philippians chapter 2?
And our verse, our text is Philippians 2, 1 through 8. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Did y'all see Peter's heart there also as we read from Peter? It's so similar, brethren. We now have the witness of two. Complete my joy by being in the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. I mean, he's doing a miniature version of what I'm trying to do. Okay, Paul, but why? Why should I do this? Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Yeah, you're going to bring the homeless poor into your home. You're going to bring the stranger, the well-dressed stranger from church that maybe has a couple kids, and they're going to mess up your carpet. They're going to spill their coffee. They're going to break your glasses and your dishes. You might invite the stranger over, and he might steal some jewelry from you. He might be a false Christian. He might be a wolf in sheep's clothing. Brethren, you will lose when you invite the stranger into your home. They may offend your kids. Their kids may hit your kid with a stick. My kid will hit your kid with a stick. (laughs) I promise you that. Brethren, they may burn the house down. You may become poor. You may become poor in this effort. Brethren, you are not going to lose anything more than the Lord Jesus Christ has lost when he emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant. Brethren, we are never going to go so low as he went for us. And we'll invite people we like over and they may be the ones to destroy our house. I can deal with that probably to a certain extent. But brethren, when Christ did this thing, There was no one likable. He came into his own and his own received him not. He came in the midst of people who were so estranged to him and to the Father. They killed him and they received him not. And he did it even for the very ones who cried out for his blood. Well, that's one way it's like Christ. Brethren, I had so many that came to mind. I mean, so does he have a home though? Okay, he's hospitable. He gave up all. I'm working off of really the definition that we have of entering to someone's suffering, fellowshipping in the suffering of a people. I'm working off of that definition and looking at Christ, but we can even go to maybe even a more material definition and look at how is Christ hospitable beyond measure to the stranger, and to the vile, to the enemy. Well, we see that he even has declared that he has prepared a place for us. He says, if I go away, I prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I mean, what a thought is that? How long has he been gone now? I like to think that he's still preparing a place. If the six-day creation was so glorious to fill us and give us so much abundance. This is his home, and we forget that, brethren. If he gave us so much in the very beginning, and he's been gone this long preparing a place, how, much ex- how excited should we be? My wife needs how long to get the house ready for Bible study? She can whip it out pretty quick, and it looks, it looks decent. We're mid-range hospitality. But brethren, he is preparing new heavens and a new earth in which we are going to dwell. I love his parables. Go into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. 
There's a great feast he's going to throw for us. He's going to even meet those needs. If it's not enough for you that he suffered and died, if that's not reason enough, he's throwing a banquet even. We're going to sit with the great men of the earth of faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, you will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob while the sons of the kingdom will be cast out. Brethren, this is our privilege granted to us by such a gracious and hospitable God. You want to stay on this point. I want to stay on this point. We need to move on. It's hard to leave our Lord, but bear, bear all this in mind. Point number C, letter C. Why should I show hospitality to the stranger? Why should I risk my substance, my time, my children, my family, perhaps even my life? Well, here's another reason. For your assurance. For the assurance of your own salvation, we should do this very thing. I have met and talked to many people who fall into serious doubt as to whether or not I'm truly saved. One of my first questions I ask them is, well, where are you going to church? Which, which of the brethren are you fellowshipping with that are helping you in this walk? Ah, I don't go to church. I watch it at home. How are you supposed to know if the love of God is dwelling within you if you don't have a way in which to exercise all that he has given you upon the body of Christ? Brethren, I mean, this, there are some of you in here who probably doubt whether or not they truly know the Lord. I don't know your hearts. I've had conversations with some, and that's been revealed. And by God's grace, they're walking in confidence now. The Lord works through means, and one of the means in which he imparts confidence is through the testimony of the brethren around you and the exercise of the fruit of the Spirit towards one another. So let me give you some biblical evidence for the fact that you can draw assurance from showing hospitality to one another and to strangers. First John, and for all those who take notes, this will be a bonus for you faithful note takers. First John 4, 7 through 21. I'm not going to read that. Brethren, I would encourage you to go and read that after the sermon today. And I want you to just see what he's saying there. But I'm going to go somewhere else. We're going to go to Hebrews 6, 9 through 11. So Hebrews 6 is notoriously terrifying for its extreme warning of what happens when you reject the Lord Jesus Christ and the full revelation about him and what it means for you. But this stood out to me when we were doing the Bible study at home that The author of Hebrews wants to move and start speaking to the faithful right after this terrifying moment. And here's what he says to not not bruise the conscience of the faithful who might be terrified that they are indeed utterly lost. He says this, Hebrews 6, 9 through 11. Though we speak in this manner, this harsh, terrifying manner, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. Things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love which you have shown for his name. How so? In serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have full assurance of hope to the end. Wow. I mean, that, it blew my mind. I'm not feeling assured. I'm listening to Paul Washer. I'm listening to all of John MacArthur. I'm trying to pray. I read my Bible all the time. And I don't do anything for the brothers and sisters in Christ. They're not assured of your salvation by your absence and lack of love. Why, why, would, why, why, should, why should they be? We run back to church. Maybe if we've been absent for so long, I got to feel saved again. I don't feel good. I don't feel assured. And we just show up. We want to quote some verses. People be like, wow, that guy really knows the Bible. He listens to all the right preachers. 
And it's almost as if we run back, jump into a church for a little bit, spend some time, I get my feelings back, and then I'll be gone again once, once some sacrificial hospitality is demanded of me. Or maybe once I've been reproved and corrected for my sin. Brethren, he says, we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have full assurance of hope until the end. He commends them for past love, sacrifice to the saints in service, and says, you did it in the past, you're still doing it, and we desire that you continue to do it. That is going to take fellowship and interaction with the brethren and commitment to a local body of believers. Okay, that's why, for your own assurance. Don't forget, read 1 John 4, 7 to 21. He's real scary, so I'm not going to read him here. D, do it for your own reward. Do it for the sake of yourself even. And that sounds, wow, that's so unspiritual. You just told me to think of others. I wouldn't even say this or put this in the list if it wasn't in Scripture because it goes against my flow. But the Scripture itself, nay, the Lord Jesus Christ himself tells you to do this very thing. It's not unspiritual to desire a heavenly reward when it's an eternal reward, when it's something offered from the Lord for you to have for all of eternity. Go to Luke 14, and we'll start at verses 12 through 14. Luke 14, 12, starting at verse 12. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest also they invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. I mean, what's, what is, how does he want to motivate you in that? It's not because I say so. He doesn't say, thus saith the Lord, therefore do it. He actually, I mean, he's so gracious. He gives you something to look forward to. We're designed that way, to long for something and to look forward to something. You will be repaid, brethren, at the resurrection of the just. And that's not, that's not, in the intermediate heaven, you're going to be resurrected. It's the resurrection. It's new heavens and new earth. Everything material and physical that you leave behind that is to be burned up and end up in an ash heap, that new rug you're afraid to get the stain on, that car you don't want to let someone borrow because they'll put a dent in it. Brethren, that is all going to the same ash heap. It's inconsequential. But you will be repaid in full and more at the resurrection of the just, on the new heaven and the new earth. How exciting is that? We'll stay in Luke. Go to Luke 16, verse 9. He says, Make friends with the unrighteous wealth of this world, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. One who is faithful with little is faithful in much. I mean, I like that. He gives this parable of the, of the shrewd dealer, the shrewd steward who has failed in his stewardship, and he sneakily goes around and has his master's debts forgiven for less, so that way he can go and enter into their homes after he gets put out of, out of his place. And then the Lord sums it up, and he says, make friends with the unrighteous wealth of this world, so that when it fails, your money will fail, your investments will fail, people. That when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. I like that. There's, um, there's a great book by Randy Alcorn called Heaven. I'm 100% with him on this matter, that it, it, it appears the Lord is making an ass- making an assumption that we're going to visit one another in individual homes and dwellings on the new earth. 
It's what we're designed for. We're designed to be physical. We're designed to fellowship, to eat. We see that all throughout Scripture, that it is a new heaven and a new earth with the same kind of earthly goings-ons. There's nations and tribes. Why would there not be fellowship and visitation one to another? And then he says, he says, he who is faithful with little is faithful in much. This works with the talents, isn't it? One's given one talent, one's given five, one's given ten. He who makes a return with it, he says, make him ruler over five cities. Make him ruler over ten cities. Brethren, we can be investing, we can be investing into an, inter- an eternal realm and we, where we can continue in this blessed fellowship, one with another. And I like he says, he who is faithful with little is faithful in much. Again, your $500,000 home, the Lord calls it little. The $1 million, it's little. If you're faithful with that little, you're faithful in much. You will be faithful in much. I think of, y'all think of people who have done this in this day and age. I mean, look back to the people that we looked at already. They sacrificed much, risking their own lives. I think of, I thought of Corey Ten Boom, and I couldn't get her out of my mind. I couldn't get her out of my mind when I thought of this very thing. That here is Corey Ten Boom hid Jews and Christians during the Nazi occupation, and she was in Poland, I believe. Small little house. Her and her father and her sister lived there. She's in middle age, and she's hiding Jews in a tiny room that was built into the house, and she hid and saved hundreds and hundreds of them to the risk of her own life. And it cost, it did, it cost the life of her father, of her sister. She entered in to the fellowship of suffering with these people. They sacrificed food, comfort. They were starving with them. They shared what little coffee, what little provisions they had, what little space they had. They became poor, not even so these people could become rich, just so they could survive. And then she gets caught. She gets sent to a concentration camp. She is entered in completely in the fellowship of suffering with these people. They're getting eaten by lice. They're freezing to death, stuffing newspaper into their clothing to stay warm. Brethren, hundreds of people. She did so much because our God is so strong and so powerful to work this out in our lives. And I think, I thought when I was under this point for the reward, man, give Corey Ten Boom, ten cities, people, to house all those of whom she served. I mean, I wonder, you're going to see Corey Ten Boom town, brethren, Hundreds of people that she sacrificed for. I don't think it's going to be hard to find her in the new earth. You'll stop some people on the streets and they'll be like, oh, I know her. She helped me in the former age. She has a good reward, brethren. Her sister who died in the concentration camp slowly has a good reward. And you read, you read her biography, you read The Hiding Place, Corey Ten Boom was even ashamed of her own self because every time the sister kept saying, these poor people are suffering so badly, Corey's like, I know. These, these poor Jews, these people in the camps, and the sister would go, oh no, I meant the soldiers. I meant these people so blinded by their sin and their hatred. And Corey, this happened more than once, Corey realized, oh wow. She thought too highly of herself even at times. Okay, brethren, for your own reward, store up for yourselves money bags that will not wear out. Those are our Lord's words. Guys, some of us have already built the bigger barns and we have said to our soul, take your rest. I'm tempted with that so often and I fail so often. Okay, another point, F, point F. Why should you show hospitality to strangers and the brethren? And the strangers are, it is implied that they're brethren. We'll see that here in this point. It's those who name the name of Christ. We are to be so willing and open to serve them and to provide for them. 
And point F is to be a partaker in the gospel by helping the brethren and showing hospitality, you will then enter into partnership with the evangelist. Not all of us are gifted to share the gospel. Not all of us are even mature enough to go and present the the gospel presentation, depending on when we have gotten saved. But listen to this, 3 John. Here's, Here's my guy Gaius that really stood out to me. John writes to him and says, 3 John, verses 5 through 8, Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for the brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. That's exciting. I think I have been gifted with evangelism. It is a terrifying thing. It's hard to do. I'm nervous every time. But it's not a gift that everyone will possess. And some, some of you even maybe might be ashamed of cowering back from a time you thought you, put a, you should have said something, bear testimony to the Lord. I feel that almost every day in every encounter I have. But brethren, you can be made a partaker of the gospel ministry by supporting faithful missionaries, by supporting your local church, your local pastor. I mean, have you not read, brethren, what David had said? He who watches the stuff, this is the King James, he who watches the stuff will share in the spoils as he who goes down to the battle. I mean, that's what a great, what a great word that is. Brethren, if you can't share the gospel and you find, you find it hard to do, take solace in knowing that supporting of the church and the brethren, you are made a partaker of the gospel. If you can't shoot people, carry the bullets. Point, point G, and this is my last point for why should I do this thing, is to be a witness to the world. For some reason... I just found it fascinating. It's not necessarily that you're going to win converts by your witness, but the Lord is just glorified even when we can't be spoken evil against. There's going to be a point in time when people will see persecution happening to a faithful Christian. Realize At a certain point, they realize this man has done nothing wrong. They saw that of our Lord. The Roman centurion said, this man truly was innocent, right? And God is glorified when the wickedness of people is put to shame. And Jesus says this in John, he says, by this, people will know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And I've been arguing that, w- that love is demonstrated through this hospitality and the fellowship of suffering and meeting the needs of the saints. So we'll close it. Why should I show hospitality? And there's more. I mean, man, you can go all throughout scripture and you can see it everywhere. Countless of examples. I just gave you some. So we'll move on to my final point, point three, hindrances. What may be stopping you from showing hospitality to strangers? These are in no real particular order. Um, I kind of started practically for the first. All of this, though, I mean, there's almost like it's, you almost think about it right off the bat. There is one main reason probably why we won't do this thing, and it is fear. That's my second point. But it is. I mean, this is going to be, this is scary. It's a scary thing to do. But before we get to the point of fear, I thought practically what's going to stop us, as I've already touched on it, is the lack of fellowship and not being committed to a body in which to exercise the gift of hospitality. And I don't mean church membership. You don't have to officially sign up. Um... That's not, that's not what I mean at all. I mean, you can't go and spend, and spend six months with someone and then go to another church and, and, and spend six months. You're, not, you're just practically not going to feel for these people by jumping around and living in the world of acquaintances. It's going to take a deep, heartfelt connection of watching people grow in Christ, watching the children grow up and realize, I've been at this church Whoever's been here, people have been here for quite some time. 
They've watched whole children grow up to become believers. It's hard to walk away from someone after you've preached to them for two years, five years, and turn your heart to their need. Brethren, we're probably not practicing this level of hospitality out in the open and abroad in the Church of the West because we have so many options for church and we run around everywhere. We just do. They're not like John MacArthur. Oh, I went there. They weren't like Paul Washer in the preaching. I just wasn't convicted, so I'm gone. And you'll keep doing that, brethren. If your main pastor in teaching is an amazing pastor like John MacArthur or Paul Washer, Tim Conway is one of my favorite. If he's your main teacher, then you're going to have a problem with committing to a local church and fellowship. It is not how the Lord intended it. We are to greet one another by name. We are to know one another. We are to be an intimate fellowship. I mean, the root word, just a reminder of this, koinonia was the root word, koinonia was the root word back in Romans 12, 13 for contribute to the necessities of the saints. It's a fellowship and it's deep. And it's deep. Okay, my second point under why uh, hindrances, what may be stopping you is, is fear or lack of faith. We're just afraid of all the things I've already mentioned. We're afraid of the damage that could be done to our, to our lives, to our home, to our things, our stuff, our possessions, our family, our precious daughters, our dear sons. We're afraid we might be made poor. We just don't believe that the Lord truly will work everything out for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Brethren, we, we genuinely, we don't want to say this. I don't want to say this. I don't genuinely believe that he who lends to the Lord lends to the poor and that the Lord will repay him. Or maybe it's that I'm impatient and I don't think I can wait till the resurrection. I'm hoping he's going to repay me now and he may not. Brethren, we're just afraid. <laughs> if we're just going to be honest. We're afraid. Sometimes we're just afraid to have the awkward conversation. I want to invite this person, but I'm, I'm, I'm socially awkward. I say dumb stuff. I'm introverted. I don't really know. I haven't been a part of people. I've been hurt before when I committed to a church. Brethren, he says, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ. I mean, that's, where is that? That's in Philippians, isn't it? Philippians has the whole region of Philippi, the church in Philippi, for some reason, is just magnified as the hospitality church. They're mentioned in Corinthians. They're mentioned in Acts 17. You have the Philippian jailer, jailer Lydia, their whole book, you supplied to my needs once and again. I am fully supplied. They didn't just send him stuff. They were already so poor. He tried to stop them and said, no more, guys. It's too much. And they said, no, we beg you, let us have this blessing that we should, that we should provide for your need. And then they sent Epaphroditus also. Not just stuff. They sent Epaphroditus to the prison to go minister to his needs. Brethren, that is the fellowship of suffering. And Paphroditus was so heartbroken, he almost died missing his church. Wow. Brethren, it's going to be scary to go into the prisons. And even here, it's safe. You're probably going to be okay. Brethren, our brothers and sisters are dying all the world over because they're locked in prisons where there is no clothing, there is no food. I mean, people, who was it? Is it... Was it Adoniram Judson? His wife had to go and feed him or he would die in the prison? I might have him confused with another missionary. It's scary, guys. But our fears and our lack of faith in the word and in God will prevent us. Another thing that might prevent us is a lack of love or putting ourselves first. And now this guy really stood out to me. In 3 John, we can go here. You have Gaius, 
who is the host of the church of strangers. And again, it struck me, these people are recorded for all of eternity. This is their testimony that we have. And then you have another guy in here. There's three guys mentioned by name. But you have, you have Diotrephes. And here's what, here's what John says about Diotrephes. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us, and not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. I mean, yeah, Diotrephes wants to be first. He is the primary considerer of his own needs, first and foremost. And what is the end result of that? I mean, I wouldn't put that. I would put greed and money. I mean, it's lack of fellowship and lack of hospitality. That's what he's charged with. He wants to bring up. He doesn't bring up idolatry. He doesn't bring up other things. He says, yes, he likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority, and the end result of that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and he even tries to stop people. I thought, why does he even try to stop people? Wouldn't you want your congregation to grow and then maybe you get more money if he's a false teacher? I think he wants all those resources for himself, perhaps. I don't know what his mindset is. But here he is, a monument to self-love and the failings of hospitality. So putting self first. Uh, another point, and we're still here with Diotrephes. My other point is, and this one really stood out, rejecting the authority of Scripture and of the apostles. Look, we may be... We may be hindered, we may be not exercising biblical hospitality and we're hindered in it because we don't really believe the authority of the scripture of what it's telling us to do. And that stood out to me. We, in this theological circle, we acknowledge that the scripture is authoritative. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. We submit to the word. Isaiah says, this is to whom I will look, he who is humble and of a contrite heart and who trembles at my word. And so we say, we must tremble at the word. Amen. We do that. We recognize the authority of the scriptures. Except when we're to bring the homeless poor into the house. Brethren, we, we tend to reject some of the authority of the scriptures if we're being honest. I saw my brother in need. He needed whatever he needed. It was $100. I didn't think I was going to be taken care of. We we're going to stand before the Lord. You had the word. It told you plainly. Are we going to say, yes, Lord, I saw my brother in need, but I didn't think you really were going to resupply me. Brethren, if you reject the authority of the word and the authority of God's promises, we are going to have a hard time doing this very thing of biblical hospitality to strangers. Then we have forgetfulness. Hebrews 1, uh, Hebrews 13, 1, I quoted it earlier. He says, and do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. This is a bummer, really, on my part. I'll go a week and realize I forgot to check in on my brother. Just forgot to text him. I forgot to see how he's doing. I said I would. I just forgot to invite you. Brethren, we have inspired word of God telling us, don't forget. Why would he do that? Because we forget. Do not neglect or forget to show hospitality. Okay, and this is my last point. Is, and it's pretty apparent. It's pretty obvious. It's worldliness. I mean, we're just not heavenly minded. We just don't set our thoughts on things above where Christ is. Right? I mean, we are just, we are forgetful that it is all going to burn up. It all ends up on the same ash heap. He says this in Peter, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 
We forget that it's all perishable, and we could be making a much better investment, brothers. We, some of us have invested in homes and in lands, perhaps in the stock market. Maybe we should be moving our equity somewhere else. Okay. Well, that's it for the points. We'll conclude. I want to go back again to the heart of the whole thing. The most glorious bit of, the, of this is that we should look upon Christ one more time. And let's be reminded of what he's done but maybe with a different verse. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Second Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Brethren, we are rich. It sounds so unspiritual, but the scripture alone declares it. We are so rich. We have been given the very Son of God, to be our Lord and Savior, to be our big brother and our example. And he came to a wretched, despised people. I set myself personally against Christianity and the Christian notion of Jesus Christ when I was a Hindu. I longed to argue with Christians and to make them look foolish. I was a blasphemer. I was many, many other things. I was a railer and a reviler, and he set his love upon me and became poor so that I could become rich, that I should be welcomed into his home despite all the damage done to his house and his people. He suffered his children to come and try to bear witness to me. He suffered them to possibly be hurt, injured, or corrupted. I have offended his people before I was a Christian. As a Christian, I've offended his people. And he's been so rich and gracious. He gave himself, brethren, for a sinful people. Philippians 3.10. This is Paul's, this is Paul's heart. He says, it is my determined purpose that I should know him, that I should be intimately acquainted with his death and resurrection, and to be made a partaker of his sufferings. And that's that word for fellowship. Fellowship and the suffering of Christ is what we're called to do. First John, if you go home and read it, like I suggested, he says, we are to lay our lives down for the brethren because he laid his life down for us. And I tell you this, and I want to end with this too, he himself warned that we should count this cost. He told us this early on before. Brethren, I don't know how much we heard that we are to lay the life, our lives down for the brethren. I'm willing to lay my life down for my wife, commanded in scripture, I'll do it for my kids. Will I do it for the stranger? the way Christ did for us when we were strangers. Let's pray. Well, gracious God and Father, we thank you so much that you empower us to do these very things that are impossible for us to do in the flesh. Lord, we, we are not just naturally equipped on our own to do these things. And we are so grateful for your promises in Scripture and for your Spirit And God, now I ask that you would pour out your spirit upon us this day, tomorrow, all the rest of the week, Lord, really for all the rest of our Christian walk, that we should enter into the fellowship of joy with the believers, to rejoice with them, and in the fellowship of the sufferings with one another, to suffer and to weep with them together, Lord, 
and that we should wait earnestly and patiently for you to tell us to enter into our rest and not that we should say to our own soul, enter thou into thy rest. And Lord, would that we would seek to wait for you to dry the tears from our eyes yourself and not seek that we should avoid all hardship and sorrow and suffering on this side. Such a futile attempt, Lord. It cannot be done. Lord, let us wait for you with, e- with eager expectation. We look to you for this and for many other things that we need. We praise you for it, O oh God. We, we love you. And we pray that your name would go forth into all the earth. Amen. Will our ushers please come forward? God of grace and God of glory on thy people pour thy power crown thy name in church's story bring her bud to glorious flower grant us wisdom grant us courage for the facing of this hour facing of this hour. Lo, the host of evil around us scorn thy Christ, though sail his ways. Fears and doubts too long have bound us. Free our hearts to work and praise. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, Warring madness, bend our pride to thy control. Shame our want and selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Lest we miss thy kingdom. Set our feet on lofty places, gird our lives that they may be armored with all Christ-like graces in the fight to set men free. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, that we fill our men with our heads in prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for your great name. We thank you for our salvation and for the body of Christ. Father, we uh, pray that we are mindful to set our things, um, set our minds on things above, that we would uh, have a sacrificial uh, spirit of hospitality knowing that our practice of hospitality may influence those to come to true salvation to be added to the body of Christ. 
extending your kingdom. But Father, this does not come without great love and great uh, 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 compassion for the saints, for the strangers. Let us practice our hospitality to those who are strangers, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And God, uh, may this be uh, a great reminder that this is one of the hearts of evangelism. We thank you, God, for the great reminder from Atticus through the word of God. And may we practice these things and that we would be faithful uh, to be found in your sight, a well done and good and faithful servant. And we want to glorify your great name. Amen.